Max, we'd love to hear your stories. And so, yeah, please take us on a journey. Can everyone see that? Yes, perfect. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, that was that was absolutely fascinating. Um, really interesting to hear. Um, I'm basically just a photographer. I wouldn't call myself a mycologist. I focus on macro subjects, uh, mainly the slime molds and fungi. And I've been doing that quite intensely for about four years now. Um, I post most of my photos on Instagram just to try and inspire, inspire other people about what's beneath their feet, trying to connect people through mycelium, sort of building a community of like-minded mycologists, mushroom enthusiasts, to hopefully further research and study. Um, I don't have any formal training in science or mycology. All, of, all that I've learned is just self-taught with the guidance of kind of local mentors and groups. And um, yeah, thanks for asking me here. Um, hopefully some of it will be interesting i'm not sure if i've got any answers or if there's going to be any big revelations um but we're going to touch on a few of my favorite fungi um but the subject's so massive i could literally talk for hours about cultivation foraging eating mushrooms medicinal mushrooms um could talk for days about where to find them how to take the pictures as well and i'm sure you guys are all very familiar with fungi and their role so I'm going to skim through a few bits and take a look at some subjects which I think are quite cool and uh, yeah hopefully try and make some of it relevant to composting or soil at least and uh, yeah at the end maybe we could have some questions but I'm um, not sure if I'll be able to answer them but if I can't then I've got a lovely network of people that might be able to help. So mushrooms are obviously the fruiting body of fungi. Um, without fungi, this ecosystem isn't going to work. Dead organic matter would be piled high, nutrients locked up within that wouldn't be available. Um, there's about 90% of land plants rely on mycorrhizal fungi. And the main role is to decompose, and decomposers range from tiny bacteria, large invertebrates, all of which are obviously healthy for, uh, vital for a healthy balance of the soil food web. And uh, yeah, in the UK, there's about 15,000 known species, although that's probably out of date already. And it was only in 1969 that um, the fungi was actually separated from animals and plants. So it's grossly understudied, underfunded, and we probably know more about space. And considering how integral they are to our survival, that's pretty crazy. And this is, um, this is the design my friend did We've sort of collaborated on the clothing thing, so I'm just sort of bumping that. It's moss and mochella. And that the money from the clothing is going to fund us to go on trips and research. And I spotted this on Twitter the other day, and all credit to the people up on the top right. And it's it's actually they've given it out for free download. So I'll send the link to Tom and I'm going to get a poster of this anyway and get it printed. But I thought it was quite nice because I'm going to start right at the bottom down here with this Pilobolus and then um, this Entomorphora species. Wow. So Pilobolus crystallinus, or crystallinus is a dung cannon or a hat thrower. And it, uh, it gets its name because pressure builds up and these little black sporangia shoot off and they land in vegetation, which is then eaten by grazing animals, pass through digestive tract, and then it grows again in the manure. And uh, interestingly, this one was found in compost. So, I mean, I guess that the conditions in the tumbler maybe have mimicked the conditions through the animal's stomach, and that was able to, to fruit. Another one, another example of Pilobolus, shot in the morning these things are tiny as well um, very delicate and to, to capture them requires a, a bit of skill and uh, they sometimes disappear right in front of your eyes so one minute you'll be focusing and the next minute it's gone and the sporangia is just shot off and this is a, a, a tangled mess of uh, the bulobolus the and I kind of cultivated these and when I say cultivated I mean, I brought home some manure and uh, introduced it to moist conditions, but like one of these little food container with holes in and uh, 
a little bit of damp tissue and they tend to fruit. And uh, yeah, they're beautiful little fungi. This is what they look like at the early stage. So if you're ever passing some manure and you see these tiny little orange dots, that's the early stage of the pilobolus. Really tiny, so that's kind of behind the scenes shot of some tiny little things, but very beautiful in my opinion. Got quite a few slides to get through, so <laughs> I'm just going to whiz through quite a lot of them. Um, this is a uh, asexual form of Peronia punctata. It's actually found exclusively on pony poo in the New Forest, and it was ID'd by a member of the British Mycological Society, Neil Mailer, who gave me some tips on how to store it. So um, not many species, uh, well, I mean, there's, there's new species being described all the time, and I don't think everybody's willing to keep poo in a box. So um, I thought it would be a good place to start to find something cool. And I kept this one for a few months, rehydrated it, and uh, this thing sort of started to grow, which I monitored for a little while, which um, the, the, it's the asexual stage of mushrooms, I think that when they have favorable environments, they'll reproduce in an asexual form just to increase the numbers. And uh, it turned into that, which I just think is pretty beautiful to um, put in a box and do this as a conio for. So, continue with the, the thing of working this bit. This one was collected, this is deer scat, and um, I'm not exactly sure on the, the ID of this one, Coprinellus maybe, it, it looks very much like a, quite a rare coprinoid that um, the pictures match in folks, but this was pre me having a microscope, so I couldn't tell, but it's just nice to see the different stages in development of fungi and be able to identify them at different stages. And obviously dung fungi play a really important ecological role, recycling nutrients and making break down really complex molecules. So moving away from poo in a box, but this one, Entomophora, Morphora, Mothgate, Tom actually put me onto this one. This was at a local farm. It had uh, quite a lot of flies around and this fungus infects flies. And uh, certain fungi can hijack the nervous system, which you probably already know. You've heard of cordyceps doing that to ants. This is a similar thing where the fungi will infect the fly and the fly will crawl to a high place and it will extend its proboscis fixing it in place and it arches its wings back in what they call a death pose and um, the spores eventually burst out of the abdomen trying to infect as many flies as possible being on that high point and uh, with the abdomen swelling it also attracts males to try and mate with the females so it spreads it quite a lot so it's a bit of a weird fungus but an interesting one nevertheless another Similar species I found quite recently. There doesn't seem to be that many records in the UK. This is um, Pandora dictogena, and this one was ID'd by Nick Applin, who runs the local fungus group. It's some sort of moth fly, and they hang around damp areas. And this was underneath a stick, and I, I thought I was some sort of macro wizard taking pictures of a fly that wasn't moving, but turns out it was infected with a fungus and it was very dead. And um, it's really tiny, so just the size of a pencil tip. This is a Cortinarius species. SP stands for species. It just means that I was lazy and I didn't bother to work it out, or not, not necessarily lazy. Quite a lot of mushrooms are pretty difficult to, to ID. And um, you've got to pick your battles. But I just thought I'd include this because mushrooms obviously play a huge um, role for insects, animals as habitat. And I believe these flies lay their eggs in mushrooms, various different species. And it was sat so still that I was able to change my lens setup and get a super close picture, which I thought was kind of cool. 
So flies also help in the dispersal of spores. And this is Phallus impudicus, a stinkhorn. Some of you might have smelt this, seen this. They're fascinating little things. They tend to pop up quite quickly. There's a lot of folklore and interesting history behind them. And uh, I've got a little time lapse of this one growing. So this was shot over a few hours. I actually brought this stink one egg home. If you find one, you can bring the egg home and pop it in some soil in a plant pot and um, you can grow them yourselves. And yeah, in a matter of hours. You wouldn't want to do it in your house though. Don't, don't do that. It absolutely hums. And that was over about three or four hours, I think. I'm shooting a frame maybe every 30 seconds. There's definitely room for improvement with those so lighting and practice. So I'll, uh, I'll try and do some more this year. If I can get to the next slide. This yeah. one, similar flies disperse the spores for this mushroom, Clatherus ruber or basket stinkhorn. And uh, this one was another compost club member who let me into her garden, I believe it's Joanna. I hope I've got the name right. But her Instagram's there. Um, pretty rare in the UK and a fascinating one to see. This is Hypholoma fasciculare or sulfur tuft, really common mushroom. Um, this is under UV light, 365 nm UV, and they actually fluoresce. Um, not quite sure why, but people suggest that it could be to do with attracting flies for spore dispersal because they can see in that spectrum and basically the phosphors get hit by the UV light and they naturally fluoresce and there's a few mushrooms that do. There's some lichens that fluoresce so there's a daylight comparison there and the other day I found this one which I thought was quite cool. This is just um, uh, trichomes on a hazel tree fluorescing so all sorts of things fluoresce in the forest at night. It's absolutely fascinating to get a UV torch and just kind of have a poke around. Insects, mushrooms, all sorts, I'd highly recommend. From UV fluorescence to bioluminescence, this one is a Jacko lantern, Amphilotus eludens. I was notified about this one with a local group, a friend of mine, Iona, who I actually met here, we met with a group of people and went and um, checked this out at one in the morning when the street lamps went off. We all had blankets over our head trying to watch the bioluminescence. You can see it, it is very faint and it was a real pain to take a photo of. I ended up bringing some home because there was absolutely tons of it and uh, I shot this as a composite. So one exposure for the gills and then another for the highlight. And that's what it looked like in the daytime of it lovely Ganoderma next to it. It was just in a, it was not far from me, you know, a small sort of council block with a big tree in the middle and there was tons of mushroom there, which is always good to see. Uh, Ferramacea, I can't pronounce most of the, but the uh, Latin names. Ferramerasmus erinaceus, but the hedgehog scaly cap is just a great common name. And this is what, um, I posted in the group my friend I own ID. So we got working together quite a lot and uh, we share finds, we share locations, and we go out and do microscopy. And this is a species which turned up on a tea towel in her back garden. And it's not particularly common to Conica horizontalis. And uh, Kew Gardens are interested in this one to add to their collection for the Darling's Tree of Life project. So. I cloned this one for them and uh, we went and delivered that to Kew Gardens. And whilst we were there, we found this one. It's kind of cool, orange pill, pretty common. But that one was again was added to the Darwin's Tree of Life project. And thankfully, Dr. Brian Douglas is going to lend us some equipment to be able to do some sequencing on the finds that we have so we can contribute and add those to Gene Bank and along with the photos and microscopy, it, it would be nice for people around the world to be able to reference those. So not, not quite started on that yet, so I can't really say much, but more on that as it happens. Just an, an idea of how tiny some of these species can be. 
this one was so tiny and too cute to move, so I left it where it is and it remained a sp as a species. Merasmius hudsoni, it's a mushroom that grows on a holly leaf. Pretty common, I think, I find it quite a lot. Um, but yeah, beautiful, weird, and it had to be included. I just want to say, Max, this is absolutely amazing. I do, that's the funny thing about Zoom is that like you can't, you don't, you don't get any feedback. You like, I can't even see you guys. Which you don't even crazy. know how this is going. Nervous, so I hope I'm not whizzing through it too much. No, it's so exciting, and you're going at a really good speed. And good, good. Um, it. Thank you. This is porcelain fungus, which as a lot of people consider good edible. Um, it was just really pretty, so it had to be included. And. Uh, I found this at the same spot, just in the car park. And it's, this was shot with a, a wide angle lens, but it also, you can shoot macro with it, so you can get really close and it just makes you feel like you can really dive into the image, which, which works on a big screen. Um, this is the one which I think you guys are probably most interested in. Um, Garden giant, Pinstrafaria. This one was grown in a potato bag, actually, just with um, straw, wood chip cardboard kind of lasagna type thing. Great for gardeners and permaculturists. Um, it unlocks nutrients and will enhance soil. And I know people are using this like spent grain to sort of a micro-remediation to improve aeration and maintain structure in the soil. Um, the allotment that I'm working on with Iona, all the wood chip beds are inoculated with these and I've done some sort of rows in between some of the veg, but I mean, I'm not a particularly experienced grower. I've, I've owned plants forever and had an interest in them, but I think you guys are way more knowledgeable on that subject than me. Um, and this is, this is one that you might recognize. Again, species-wise, I'm gonna call it a coprinoid, a compost coprinoid. It could be various. I know somebody who could be interested. I've actually got some in a plant pot behind me, which I'm gonna have a look under the microscope at and see if we can work it out. But I know coprinoids are notoriously difficult, but I do know a couple of experts, which I'm going to annoy to try and get an idea on that. A Mycena species, I'm not exactly sure. It was just too beautiful to, to move. Like a lot of fungi you're going to have to remove and do spore prints and some require DNA analysis to get a solid ID. And some are just too pretty to move. And this one was down in the new forest last year which was um, probably one of my favourite photos, actually. This is me with a giant bolete. Bolet. Um, good example of a mycorrhizal fungi, everyone's favourite, the set, penny bun, porcini. Um, these grow with beech, birch, sometimes oak, pine, spruce, and other conifers occasionally. This one grew locally, and I sort of sat with it for a while. Um, wasn't sure whether to pick it because it's so big, but, you know, it's done its job, it's dropped its spores, and I figured I had to really just to weigh it, and um, it was 2.7 kilograms, and weirdly no bugs, so I kept this one, dried it, and used it in gravies and stock, which was absolutely delicious. So, yeah, whizzed through some fungi, going to talk about slime moulds. A little bit. Um, this is a Steminitis species under UV, which isn't particularly exciting. It's just I never really see this particular plasmodium above ground. Um, I don't see it underground either, obviously, but it was quite pretty. And the red fluorescence is chlorophyll in plants. Um, very little is known about mixing my seeds. There's loads of research being done. Um, loads of exciting research and various uses but what I've seen personally is they're providing food and habitat for all kinds of creatures I mean springtails are always on mixos um, they're obviously supporting a lot of life which means they are of already a great significance to your soil food web but I, I suspect they're doing quite a lot more than we give them credit for so they're not plant animal or fungi, but they have a, their cells have a nucleus, single cells with nuclei fused to form multi-nucleate cells that have many nuclei, and they're, they're visible as plasmodium. 
So the, the plasmodium creep around on organic matter and they feed on bacteria and some species eat fungi. And when they fruit, they've got the most beautiful structures and they sort of resemble fungi in a sense because they create a spore bearing structure. And um, the life cycle here from the fruiting body to the spore, when um, depending on where the spore lands and what the conditions are like, they'll, they'll germinate and be a, a mixo amoeba or a swarm cell or a flagellate. Um, now you guys will probably understand better than me about the balance of amoeba, protozoa, flagellate, nematode needed for the healthy soil food web balance. So some of you guys might even be looking at mixo amoeba under the microscopes. So what are they doing and what, what's the purpose? I'm not really sure. But um, there's some interesting studies going on in Japan about potential medicinal benefit, benefits of the compound. And um, they're found in most organic material. I personally find mine or certain species in, in very well rotten wood. And um, sometimes I can see plasmodium that extends about a metre, but I'm sure they get a lot bigger. And NASA have used slime moulds. They, they build like quite complex filamentary networks in search of food. Um, and I think NASA have basically designed a computer algorithm inspired by slime mold behavior. Um, and there seems to be quite an uncanny resemblance between the two networks, one crafted by biological evolution and another by modern force of gravity, which is pretty fascinating. The Tokyo subway system is probably the most famous experiment with slime mold, which demonstrates cellular intelligence. After about 26 hours, they reorganize themselves in a more efficient manner than the, the current infrastructure. And uh, this is one of my pets doing exactly that. This is just feeding on oats and agar, but you can see that sort of pathway it's created to connect the two food sources. I've put quite a lot of slime molds in, so if we run out of time, just let me know, but I'm gonna whiz through them um, if possible. Keep going. And this is um, Arceria cinerea, probably the most common mix over. This fruited in one of my moist chambers, so one of these things. And uh, yeah, they're, they're fascinating little things, tiny, but beautiful. And they do require sort of specialized photography to capture. Um, I use a process called macro stacking, where you take lots of pictures from front to back, let's say, and then you compose that image to give clarity at this magnification. Steminitis in an early stage. This is one of the oldest known fossilized slimes, which dates back about 100 million years. And they go through quite a rapid transformation in shape and color. This was a few hours later. From here, it will go red, brown, black, and harden to develop that kind of, or release their spores. It's another Steminitis, Steminitis, and Different species, this one goes white, red, black. Again, even with microscopy, I find it quite difficult to ID these things, but I'm working on that. But if you can see at the bottom here, the little springtail, there's one up there, absolutely loving life. And there's certain beetles that will live pretty much or feed on exclusively slime molds. I don't think any are toxic. I know some of them contain a lot of zinc, but some are edible. This is two for one. Trichia species, maybe Trichia varia, I'm not quite sure. And this is infected with a uh, fungus, Polycephalomyces tomentosus. And I just liked it because the little droplet suspended, it looked pretty beautiful. Another Trichia, possibly the sepiums, infected by a mushroom, the fungus. Fasarum. Um, most slime molds will need microscopy to, to ID. You have to look at certain features, spores, uh, capillation, peridium. Um, we'll see, see some examples of those in a minute, but the lime nodes on the peridium here give, give the species away. Metatricia floriformis. This one is a, it's actually a scarlet elf cup. I don't know if anyone knows that mushroom. It's a little red cup fungus that I put in the background and a green leaf next to it to give it a nice 
Italian flag. And this is the Metatricia Floriformis when it's opened up. And Floriformis means flower form, which you might know. Um, they tend to look quite flower shaped. And you can see here the, um, the threads of the capillation that hold the spores in just starting to burst out. And these are all a couple of millimeters, like really, really tiny. Um, beautiful things to come across. I tend to just find the same species. I think they're quite localized. There's certain species on my list, which I'm devastated that I haven't found yet, but I think I just need to go further afield. And I know a lot of them are found in areas that, um, like snow melt areas and things like that from what I've seen from others. Triple whammy, we've got coral slime, which isn't classified as a mix of my seat, but it's similar, has a similar habitat. And um, wolf's milk, this is the one that everyone likes to pop. It's quite, quite easy to see this one. It's very bright. You get quite bright oranges, bright pinks. It might be different species, I'm not too sure. But you can see all the little bugs that are around. There's a springtail here, a fly here, another fly here. So they provide good food source and habitat for all sorts of tiny little critters. Another Metatricia floriformis with a little droplet suspended, which is pretty cool. And uh, another Arceria cinerea, just with some other droplets on. I think these droplets are coming out of the slime mold. The, um, the capillation has to be dry and powdery for, to disperse the spores. So it's not quite the same as fungal gutation, but similar thing, I guess. Comatricula nigra, this is quite a common one, but it goes through this beautiful pink stage. And this one fruited at home and the yellow background is actually a banana, just to give it a nice color contrast. Nice example of the, these threads, the population exposing. This one was found in Brighton, in Stanmer Park. I mean, on any organic material, you're likely to find myxomycetes. If you were to take a piece of bark and put it in one of these, with a little bit of moisture, some oxygen, chances are you'll get a plasmodium or a mix of at some stage. So anyone can take these things home. It's another one fruiting in amongst some beautiful cobalt crust. Filigo septica, it's quite a common one, easy to find. Dog's vomit is the common name, which is pretty gross. And no doubt insects would be dispersing these dispersing these spores, and some insects are found exclusively on mixos. This is a short time lapse of uh, Fuligo septica in a plasmodium stage, plasmodium. And there was, this was a shot probably every 20, 30 seconds until my battery ran out. So it gives you an idea of how quickly it moves. So this one's called moon poo or a false puffball. This one is actually considered a delicacy in Mexico. They call it Caca del Luna. And this was shot over four days. I left my tripod in place and just went back just to capture each stage of its life. So on to my pet slime. This is slime. Um, I was lucky enough to find Sclerotia, a dormant slime mold in a stick. Um, in the middle of winter, I was just flipping logs. I occasionally do that, try not to disturb too much, but it is a good place to find various different things. And um, there was this little orange patch in the middle, which I had hoped was Sclerotia, and I brought it home. Interest introduced it to moist conditions, and it started to feed and crawl around. And this one, this is the same organism, but at the same time, and these shots were taken literally within minutes. And you can see there's quite a different behavior going on here. The one on the right is obviously feeding, it's fan shaped, it's exploring. And then the one on the left, it's um, sort of 
approaching some oats which had some pin mold on. So, I mean, I don't have answers as to why, but you could speculate that it might be maybe defensive behavior feeding, but the, the contrast in the colors and shapes is pretty interesting to, to see. And uh, where I collected this sclerotia from, I documented this species starting to fruit last year. You can see the sporangia is starting to sort of grow and form stipes or stalks, whichever you want to call them. So I followed this one for a day or so. And it's, I can get to the next slide. This was it starting to develop. A little bit further along, this was a blade of grass nearby where some started to fruit. And this was the final stage. Beautiful little miniature rock band. So yeah, whizzed through those. Thought I'd um, just share some books to credit some sources. Um, obviously Roger Phillips and Sarah Lloyd's slime mob book is fantastic. Fault, fungi of temperate Europe are essential in this country, I think. And uh, the mixed my seats of Britain and Ireland are really good. My favorite book, Eben's Bampton Mushrooms. He's um, probably the youngest published mycologist in the UK. The lovely foreword by Ali. This book, um, his mum posted a link so he had this book and you make a donation to the Devon Wildlife Trust and then you get one of these. So I thought I'd uh, promote that along with Mushroom Magazine, which I had uh, a little article and a few pictures on recently, which was a great magazine. If you wanted to, were amazing, like really inspirational. And I had a bit of imposter syndrome writing something for that, but it was, um, I think it turned out okay. I think people liked it. So, um, yeah, just a few more sources. Sussex Fungus Group, I'd suggest to anybody to join their local fungus group. There's plenty of them. Um, Iona has been a great mentor to me, helping with microscopy. Brian Douglas at Kew, Lynn Body, and the BMS groups. Oops, sorry. BMS groups on Facebook, Slime Mold Appreciation Group on Facebook, Mushroom Spotters, all these are great resources. And there's a few people at the bottom um, who have helped me with ideas or help me with photography. So I thought I'd shout those out. Um, so yeah, I hope that was interesting. Um, I don't think it was particularly relevant to, to composting, but at the end of the day, I'm a photographer. So um, <laughs> yeah, I hope you enjoyed the pictures. Mate, thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. And I've never watched a series of pictures before that made me want to be like another species. I wanted to be a fly and live in that world with all of those pink orbs and insane like detail that you've captured and entered into would anyone else like to express their appreciation for that so it's not just like a thanks kind of over thing i mean people have already said some very nice things in the chat awesome 